Well, good morning for the last time. It's been a delight to be here. I want to thank Dr. Anderson and the administration for having me come and uh, share with you. Uh, I, have, I, I believe I've been well received by the students, and I know there's still going to be a lot of questions uh, because studying theology is a lifetime project. And so in three days, you're not going to get it all, and you're not going to get all your questions answered. But let me ask, ask you to just continue uh, the pursuit with all your heart. Now today, January 27th, is International Holocaust Remembrance Day. It's the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, which is the place, the concentration camp, where most of the Jews were killed. They had a lot of different places where they were killing Jewish people, but Auschwitz was the one where, the, where more people were killed than anywhere else. And in 2019, I was over to observe the Christ, Christian camps that we have for Jewish children. And one of them is an hour and a half from Auschwitz, and I asked them to take me over there. And I got a, a private tourist party of about four or five people, and they took us around and showed us uh, everything. And after going through the buildings in Auschwitz proper, I also saw Birkenau, which is about two kilometers away. Uh, but we walked through the buildings and the various displays they had of that, and then we walked out to go to the gas chambers. And I, I walked in, into the building and I stood under the nozzles where the gas came out, wondering how the Jewish people, you know, they were told they were being de-liced, wondering how they experienced that. And then you walk, it's a very large area, they killed hundreds of them at a time. And then you walk from that room into the next room and there's ovens lined up where they took the dead bodies and put them in the ovens. And then you go outside and you cross the little street, and they have gallows set up. And the gallow was for one person. In the Nuremberg trials after World War II, the commandant of Auschwitz was declared guilty and sentenced to death. And they brought him back there and hung him so that the last thing he saw was the gas chambers and the ovens where he sent so many Jewish people. And when I, that was explained to me there, I almost shouted for joy. That came across to me. You know, it kind of, my emotions at that moment surprised me. It came across, though, firmly as justice. And I encourage you, if you ever have a chance, to, uh, to go uh, to Poland and visit uh, Auschwitz. It's worth it. Uh, you can go on the Internet, and they have drone flyovers. Uh, search for those and maybe check that out and and do a little research in Holocaust uh, studies uh, just to balance out some of your thinking because the world is not talking to us about those things as much as needs to be done. Well, this session is uh, the anti-Semitism of the social justice movement. And I'm primarily talking about the social justice movement in the United States and in England. Uh, but before I throw stones at them, I want to remind you that the, the, Christ, the traditional Christian movement has some of its own baggage. I'm just going to give you two examples, but I, I have a whole lecture on just the, the history of anti-Semitism in the church. I'm just going to give you two examples. The first is John Chrysostom. There's his Facebook picture. Uh, John Chrysostom was a famous preacher. He lived at the time of Augustine, say 400 years after Jesus. If he was living today, he would be a famous TV preacher. He was well known in the whole empire. He was called the golden mouth orator because of his great preaching. He was well respected. He had eight homilies against the Jews. And in the first homily, this is what he says. The Jewish people were driven by their drunkenness and plumpness to the ultimate evil. They kicked about, they failed to accept the yoke of Christ, nor did they pull the plow of his teaching. Another prophet hinted at this when he said, Israel is as obstinate as a stubborn heifer. Although such beasts are unfit for work, he says, they are fit for killing. One of the top preachers of Christendom, 400 years after Jesus, 
says Jews are fit for killing. Closer to home is Martin Luther. Some of you may be aware of this, uh, but Martin Luther uh, had a book that he wrote, 1543, on the Jews and their lies. And he says, first to set fire to their synagogues or schools and to bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn so that no man will ever again see a stone or cinder of them. Second, I advise that their houses also be razed and destroyed. He stopped short of saying killed them. I think he wants to remove everything that's Jewish and send them somewhere else. Nazi war criminal Julius Stryker famously used these statements of Martin Luther to defend himself at the Nuremberg trials. It didn't work. He was declared guilty. And then Luther's commentary in 1530 on Isaiah 63, he says some very nasty things about the Jews. And he uses allegorical interpretation, not a straightforward understanding of the text. Then I ask a question, how can Luther be so right on biblical authority and justification by faith alone, but so wrong on his hatred for the Jews? He was a mixed bag, and I would suggest that all of us are a mixed bag of some sort. We all still fight the tendencies of sin within us, and we have to constantly fight against them. And we can win through the power of the Spirit in our lives as Christians. He has given given us everything that we need in the Bible, in the Spirit, in our church family. We have tons of things which can help us to live right for Jesus. And I make this statement, in general statement, Christians are the most persecuted religious group throughout the world, while Jewish people are the most persecuted ethnic group in the world. I think that was up here, it actually has a statement in a recent uh, Israel My Glory uh, edition. But my main thrust today is the upside down social justice in the case of Israel. I don't know if you ever saw these a few years ago, the upside down McDonald's signs, I think most of them on the west coast, far from here. Uh, the, the, The W, instead of the M for McDonald's, stands for woman, and they were celebrating Women's Day and feminism. And so some of the McDonald's out there just turned the the sign upside down, probably at great cost. And so we're going to look at this, what's happening now in the social justice movement, so-called, and how that's uh, jiving with some liberal theology, and how that's impacting conservative replacement theology. So I want to walk through this with you very carefully, and I want you to pay attention and study these things after I leave. Be a good Berean Christian and study to see if these things aren't so. I want to begin with a statement of the Arab mayor of Nablus after the 1982 invasion of Lebanon by Israel. That was the year I was in Israel working on F-16 jet fighters as an engineer. And this statement comes out of the Palestinian uh, journal. It's a journal written by Palestinians, and I picked up several uh, library copies, or a library was throwing them away. And this is a quote that I have put into bullet form, and I want to walk you through that. He says, first of all, and this is a, a Muslim, this is not a Christian, this is a Muslim Arab, not a Christian Arab. And he says, no one was surprised by the criminal attack on Lebanon. So Israel criminally attacked Lebanon. Well, what was going on there? The PLO had been kicked out of Jordan and had all gone to to Lebanon, where they were stronger than the Lebanese government. And they had Katusha rockets just pouring into northern Israel. And after a while, Israel had enough. So they rolled their tanks into Lebanon. And they ended up surrounding Beirut and ended up destroying the Syrian Air Force in three days. Very interesting war in the first war that F-16s were used in battle. And uh, first, uh, one of the, the, the wars that caused Israel to become the bullies of the Middle East because their military was so great. And that ended any 
attempt since then of a frontal attack by other nations. So it changed the tactics uh, that they had. But a criminal attack? What if the cartels in northern Mexico started lobbing rockets into Texas and Arizona and the New Mexico? I don't know what our government would do, especially now. But I think, uh, I, well, I hope that we would do something about that. And so I think Israel had that right. It was not a criminal attack. It was an act of self-defense. But then secondly, he says... It is a continuation of Israel's policy aimed at exterminating our people physically and politically. Excuse me? They're trying to wipe out the Arabs? That was not the intent of that. And then he goes on to say, uh, and, and notice, by the way, how he's using the language of the Holocaust where Hitler's intent was to exterminate the Jews, he uses the same language and applies it to Israel's relationship to the Arabs. That's intentional. And then he says it is a continuation of the battle started by Israel at the very beginning when it considered the land to be its land. That's really the issue. They don't want Israel there at all. And then finally and sought to build a pure Israel without the inhabitants. What does he mean? Without Arabs. But wait a minute. Not so fast. Today there are almost two million Arabs who live as citizens in Israel. There are Muslim Arabs who are members of the Knesset. That's the parliament of Israel. How many Jews are in the government of Saudi Arabia? I'll give you one guess. Zero. How many Jews are in the government of Egypt? Zero. How many Jews are in the gov government of Libya? Zero. How many Jews are in the government of Iran? Zero. Something's wrong with this peddled propaganda. And in fact, the whole idea of the word Palestinian is problematic, as these people discuss that. Did you know, even in the 1940s, what the word Palestinian meant? It meant what it's meant for almost 2,000 years or, when the, or 1,800 years or so when the Romans started to use that term. It comes from the, uh, the word from the Phoenicians. And they intentionally, the Romans intentionally, after 135, the Bar Kokhba Revolution, uh, renamed it and to try to remove any semblance of Jewishness to that area. And so that word was used to describe a geographical location. And you go to the 1940s and, you, and all the writings and even Palestinian, even the, the Arabs would say this. They talk about Jewish Palestinians and Arab Palestinians. Palestinian was a geographical location. But that changed in the 1960s. Intentionally, the PLO was formed and they started to use the word Palestinian as if it were a legitimate ethnic group. And so now that's how in the popular Arab narrative it's used. And it's used intentionally in that way to put down Israel. It's a concocted ethnic group that does not exist in reality. And they've got refugee camps. Supposedly 800,000 uh, Arabs had to leave Israel in 1948 when all the nations attacked Israel and Israel won. Uh, but they forget to tell you 850,000 Jewish people were forced out of North Africa when that happened. And the refugee camps are still maintained. We're a third generation of people in the refugee camps. Why don't they assimilate them into the Arab lands? They keep them there because they want a political wedge against Israel. And they don't care about those people. And let me suggest this. Uh, this. You can look this up, but Yasser Arafat, who's dead now, but his widow and his daughter are living in Paris with $300 million. Where do they get that? From U.S. and European aid given to the Palestinian Authority. He was aggrandizing himself. He was not using it to help the refugee camps or anybody else. This statement 
here by this noblest mayor in 1982 is what I consider, and I use the label, it's the Arab narrative. And there are two ways that it is being spread right now. Political pressure, BDS, that is boycott, divest, and sanction. And theological pressure, liberation theology. Now let's walk through these two things. First, uh, boycott, divest, and sanction. BDS, boycott, refers to the boycott of the purchase of Israeli products. And by the way, uh, BDS is not working, especially in the United States. Jewish products are going well. In fact, at all of our conferences for the Friends of Israel, we, uh, we ask Israeli vendors to come and sell their products as a direct response to this BDS. And they're doing fine. Uh, the goal is anti-Israel thinking, drawing an analogy between the apartheid of South Africa and the apartheid of Israel. You know, the sanctioning that took place in the uh, 1990s seemed to work in South Africa, so they've adopted this to see if it will help the Palestinians. And there's an attempt to keep, keep Israeli speakers, academics and doctors and others from speaking at conferences or publishing in journals. So if there's a medical doctor who's very qualified at some area and he can help other doctors at conferences, they're trying to keep him from coming and speaking. But generally speaking, it's not working. And then there is a bombarding of college campuses, especially in Britain and the USA, with anti-Israel propaganda. Now let me talk about anti-Semitism on university campuses. I've noticed, uh, well, I've noticed that I haven't seen any anti-Semitism here. That's a good thing. Uh, and I hope it will never erupt in places like this. Our theology doesn't allow it. So if, if you move down that trail, you're going contrary to what we believe. And there are examples here, three that I've listed, Students of Color Conference, Students for Justice in Palestine. I'm going to deal with both of those here in a little bit. The third one I want to talk about right now, Middle Eastern Studies in all the university campuses. If you go to uh, Cornell or Harvard or the University of California, Berkeley, and you, you want to major in Middle Eastern Studies, you'll be hard-pressed to find any focus on Jewish studies. Because the programs in our major universities have bought the Arab narrative. And they don't want to allow Israel to be emphasized at all, and Jewish people to be emphasized at all relative to the Middle East. And so you have to come to a place so that's, that's Christian, conservative Christian, to actually find some uh, courses in Jewish studies. Now, the Students of Color Conferences, uh, the SOCC, over, here's a quote, and I did, I did some, I've got a lot of quotes, and I'm not gonna give you all that I have, uh, but uh, this is a conference that, that started about 10 years ago or so, that it goes every year or two, and they have a big conference, and they have thousands of students Come Now, the students are not the speakers, but they have thousands of students come, mostly on the West Coast. Uh, remember, left is left and right is right, okay, on the West Coast. And uh, this is a quote taken uh, that I took from a Jewish student who attended, because most Jewish students are progressive in their political thinking, and this seems to fit the progressive advertisement. And a couple of UCLA Jewish students went to the conference and they recorded for us their response. And I'm giving you two, two slides of this one Jewish girl um, and how she took it. She says, over the course of what was probably no longer than an hour, my history, that is her Jewish history, was denied. The murder of my people was justified and a movement whose sole purpose is the destruction of the Jewish homeland was glorified. Statements were made justifying the ruthless murder of innocent Israeli civilians, 
blatantly denying the Holocaust in which six million Jews were murdered? Why anyone in their right mind would accept these slanders as truths baffles me. But they did. These statements and others were met with endless snaps and cheers. I was taken aback. A Jewish girl named Ariel went to this excited about holding and standing forth for social justice. And what she got was, there is no place in the progressive movement for social justice for the Jews. Then we move to the Students for Justice in Palestine. Uh, this is not a group that's in Palestine, it's a group that's in the United States and in England. And a chapter of the SJP was suspended at Northeastern University in 2014, that's in the Boston area, for a couple of reasons. They defaced a statue of a Jewish donor we had a lot, of, a lot of news about statues, right? And they defaced the statue because it was a statue of a Jewish man. And then they constantly were disrupting Holocaust awareness events. And so finally the administration had enough and shut them down. And I applaud the administration for taking that stand. Uh, Northeastern um, University is a secular school. Justice, apparently, in these kinds of groups, does not include things like stopping the rockets from Gaza going into Israel. In fact, the Friends of Israel, we, we actually purchase these above-ground shelters. They're like, you know, two feet thick cement uh, and uh, hold about 20 people. And so the agricultural workers in the fields near Gaza, the rockets come across and they have like 20 seconds to get inside. And they're scattered all over the fields. And Friends of Israel uh, purchases some of those for them. Apparently, justice does not include stopping those. And it doesn't stop the balloons that with fire, that they light things on fire, nor kites going across from Gaza and landing in the fields to burn up the crops of the Israelis. It doesn't stop the bombing on buses, suicide bombers, rockets out of Lebanon, where Hezbollah right now, it's lobbing rockets into northern Israel again, and in, we're anticipating another war soon. Iran's attempt at nukes. None of these things make it into social justice discussions. I think that's a great travesty. And it's a one-sided, upside-down social justice. On the other side is not the BDS and the political things, but the theological pressure that has been merged with this, and that is liberation theology. Now let me walk you through what this is, if you're not familiar with it. Liberation theology has a focus on political deliverance, usually through nonviolent means, although sometimes violence is accepted, and I think in the Middle East it is accepted by most. It was started, liberation theology, in the middle of the 20th century, it was uh, primarily in Latin America and led by Roman Catholic priests who were Marxist. The Bible is sloganized. It was not interpreted and practiced. Certain verses in the Bible were highlighted as slogans. Uh, Moses' statement, you know, let my people go. And it was politicized. Jesus' statement, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. They would sloganize those kinds of passages. Jesus' statement out of John 8. Now, evangelical theology, on the other hand, and I'm talking about born-again Bible-believing Christianity when I use that word evangelical, has a high view of the Bible, a high view of Christ, a focus on salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, an attempt to practice the Bible at face value, and that includes what yesterday I explained to you was biblical justice. I'll leave that slide up there for just a second for you to make sure you get everything down if you'd like to. Um, liberation theology, we studied, when I was in seminary, we were studying that. It was relatively new at that time. Liberation theology is basically Marxism with Bible verses sprinkled on it. It is not biblical truth. 
And then along comes a certain version of that is Christian Palestinianism. It is a form of liberation theology focusing on the oppression of the Palestinian Arabs, both Muslims and Christians, by Israel and their need for political deliverance. And of course, Christian Palestinianism is led by Christian Arabs, or at least those claiming to be Christian. So it is a movement of professing Christians from the liberal side of the spectrum. And social justice is the key issue to them. The father of Christian Palestinian, uh, in, uh, Palestinianism is Naim Atik. There's a picture of him. He's a Palestinian Arab. He's an Anglican priest. And he wrote a key book, Justice and Only Justice, A Palestinian Theology of Liberation. He wrote that in 1989. And I have a copy. I've gone through it, and I'm going to share some of the details of that. He also, in 1989, founded a organization called Sibyl, the word Sibyl is a Arabic, comes from an Arabic term that means spring or way. Uh, Sibyl is an ecumenical organization. It promotes the Arab narrative that Israel is an apartheid nation and it supports the BDS movement. Now I want to walk you through some of the wording uh, that he gives in his book. And I'm going to use the words of Paul Wilkinson's book. It's an excellent book, Israel Betrayed. And I would, uh, cons I would recommend highly that book to you. Israel Betrayed. It's actually volume two of a two-volume set. Paul Wilkinson. Now, he's uh, charismatic, uh, but he's not really dealing with those kinds of issues. I don't agree with every little thing in the book, but uh, the overall flow of the book is correct. He actually attended some of the meetings of these guys to get firsthand information. And he actually took the time to stand up against them a little bit in the meetings. Uh, but here's, so here's his summary of things. And I'm using it in these next few slides. Uh, Sabil is the propagation of a Palestinianized version of Roman Catholic liberation theology. And so in the ecumenical aspect of that movement, you see a large Catholic contingency or uh, group. Probably more bothersome is this, and I put them together because they're related. There is the blatant distortion and de Zionization of God's Word. Now, what does he mean by that de Zionization? The removal of the land promises for Israel from the Bible. The removal of the land promises. The land promises certainly can't be taken at face value. Of course, conservative replacement theologians say the same thing. And then third, a Marcionite Jesus arrayed in Palestinian robes. That means the downplaying of the Old Testament. Marcion was a heretic in the middle of the second century. And he threw away the whole Old Testament. And he accepted only... Paul and a little bit of Luke. So he, was, he picked and chose what he wanted. And he had no use for the Old Testament. And so Paul Wilkinson describes this whole movement as a Marcionite Jesus arrayed in Palestinian robes, the downplaying of the Old Testament. I'm going to read to you a quote, a couple quotes. He says, the Naim Atik says this, Before the creation of the state of Israel, 1948, the Old Testament was considered to be an essential part of the Christian scripture, pointing and witnessing to Jesus. Since the creation of the state, some Jewish and Christian interpreters have read the Old Testament largely as a Zionist text to such an extent that it has become almost repugnant to Palestinian Christians. Now, the Jewish and Christian interpreters he's talking about were in that group. Because we take the land promises at face value. So he's talking about us, or at least part of that. Um, and so, but that has caused the Old Testament, he says, to be almost repugnant to Palestinian Christians. 
As a result, the Old Testament has generally fallen into disuse among both clergy and laity, and the church has been unable to come to terms with its ambiguities, questions, and paradoxes, especially with its direct application to the 20th century events in Palestine. And he's really bemoaning the fact, hey, Israel's in the land. And so all of these things in the Old Testament confuse us. So, what does he go on to say? He says, Palestinian Christians are looking for a hermeneutic that will help them to identify the authentic word of God in the Bible and to discern the true meaning of those biblical texts that Jewish Zionists and Christian fundamentalists cite to substantiate their subjective claims and prejudices. He's talking again about us. So they are looking for a hermeneutic that allows them to read the Old Testament so they don't have to take the land promises at face value. Well, the, the Christian replacement guys already have such a hermeneutic. Why is he talking like that? It doesn't come across to us like a true believer in God's Word. See, he is just using the Bible, not believing the Bible. I would say to him, why don't you take a hermeneutic that just takes it at face value, and guess what? You'll change your attitude about Israel. But he's not willing to go that direction. Then also, uh, Paul Wilkinson would tell us, Sabeel has an interfaith agenda at odds with the uniqueness of Jesus and the gospel of eternal life. That's not in their stuff. The gospel of eternal life. But what is shared by them, as I have there, by all the various groups, the ecumenical groups gathered together, what is shared is rejection of Israel. And that's what they center everything around. And then the last point here from Paul Wilkinson, seduction of Western evangelicals who, to, who hold to replacement theology, that is Christ at the checkpoint that started in 2010. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But before I do that, I want to ask this question, what is the end game for Christian Palestinianism? Sometimes we have these movements, okay, they have this goal, they have these views. Well, where are they going with this? You know, if, if they were to win the day, what would things look like? What would victory for their cause look like? Is it a nation called Palestine that will be run by the Islamic radicals? Because remember, the Christian Palestinians are a very small minority over there in the Palestinian area. Uh, is it a nation called Palestine that we run by the Islamic radicals with Jews living inside of it? That does not match the rhetoric of the PLO and the Palestinian Authority. Is the end game the destruction of the Jews so that only Palestinian Arabs remain? This fits the rhetoric of the PLO, but it is hardly consistent with Christian teaching. It will be doing to the Jews what they are complaining that the Jews have done to them. Is the end game a two-state solution? The leadership of the Arabs has consistently rejected a two-state solution, the many times it has been offered beginning even as early as 1937. It appears that what is really going on is a Christian expression of Palestinian Arab nationalism. Christ and the Bible are not at the center. Christ at the checkpoint. It's a series of meetings beginning in 2010 held in Israel, Palestine. Usually it's held at Bethlehem Bible College in Bethlehem, not far from where Jesus was born, and that used to be a very good school. It's mostly professing evangelicals who share the Arab narrative. There's some crossover of speakers from Sibyl. In fact, I, um, Atik, uh, Naim Atik himself has spoken at Christ at the checkpoint. Most of the speakers hold to replacement theology. There are some exceptions uh, to that. And by the way, if you want to just go to Christ at the checkpoint, uh, they have every one of the messages given since the beginning uh, by video online for you to watch. And I encourage you to go check a few of those out uh, and see what you think. 
and see if what I say is actually true. Now here is from their website, it's, it says, uh, well, let's see, I have lost a page in my notes here. Here is one of the leaders of the movement, Dr. Gary Burge. He's at Calvin Theological Seminary. He moved there a couple years ago. That's up in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, he used to be for many years at Wheaton College. Uh, and he's Presbyterian. And he has written books against Zionism and against Israel. Someone who's far worse, though, who's been part of their uh, meetings is Stephen Sizer. He's a speaker at both Sabeel and Christ at the Checkpoint. He's a retired Anglican minister. He's anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist. And he's spoken at a pro-Hezbollah conference. And he was actually forced into early retirement um, because of pressure from the Anglicans who didn't like, uh, they were worried about his anti-Semitism. And he's like, compared to, you know, Gary Burge would be a guy I could sit down and have a cup of coffee with. And uh, Stephen Sizer was a guy I can only have a cup of coffee with him if I was really going to argue with him. Note the replacement theology of Christ at the checkpoint. It says, we do not condemn the Jewish people and we reject any forms of anti-Semitism. And I appreciate that, having a statement like that on, on their website. And of course, some of their speakers, like Stephen Sizer, don't follow that. In fact, many of our supporters are Israeli Jews who believe that the present Israeli treatment of the Palestinians does not reflect the deeper moral values of Judaism itself. That does not move me because most Jews in the United States are not Zionists. In fact, there are many Jews who are actually anti-Semitic themselves. Not, not, not a majority by any means. Uh, but there is a a big debate within Jewish circles of how to deal with Israel. Um, it goes on on the website to say, we simply wish to find a life in the entire Holy Land that is free of discrimination and injustice, where each person can live without prejudice toward their race or religion. Okay, let me go back to what I said earlier. In Israel, you have Muslim Arabs in the Knesset. In the Palestinian Authority, outside of Israel, right next to Israel, there are no Jews in their government. So where is the discrimination and injustice happening? There's some holes in this kind of thinking. And they're assuming Israel is, is uh, oppressing Palestinian Arabs. Uh, and they're assuming these things. They're assuming the Arab narrative is true. But they get to us. This also means we reject theologies that lead to discrimination or privileges based on ethnicity, worldviews that promote divine national entitlement or exceptionalism. That's our worldview. Do not promote the values of the kingdom of God because they place nationalism above Jesus. So we privilege the Jews. We shouldn't privilege the Jews. But I would say this. They're attacking our dispensationalism. We believe the nationalism of Israel because of Jesus. And it's His plan, it's God's plan to have a national people if you take the Bible at face value. For lack of time, I'm going to skip this uh, statement here uh, and I want to wrap up with some recommendations. The first one is you take uh, my recommendation to you in response, little interpretation, accept little interpretation, embrace dispensationalism, and as a result, you will support Zionism, and your love for Jewish people will grow, and you will never accept the Arab narrative. The Arab narrative, in my opinion, is simply not the truth. Second recommendation. Do not accept all the actions of the present Israeli government as right just because it is Israel. Israel has a very robust Supreme Court 
And that court has often ruled against Jewish people in favor of Palestinian citizens in Israel. So be careful before you treat the Jews like they're not being fair. And then number three, remember that Jesus is Jewish. Do you ever think about that? How can we not love the Jewish people? The Apostle Paul said, and this is a quote, Romans eleven twenty-eight: 28, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. God still loves the Jewish people. He still has a plan for the national future of Israel. And so we, reading the scriptures at face value as dispensationalists, just accept what God says. And although we try to love all people, culture tries to keep us from loving all people, but we're going to do it anyway. And we're going to love the Jews as God's nationally chosen people. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. And uh, thank you for allowing me to give this history lesson of things that are happening right now. And uh, Lord, remind us over and over what your scripture says about the land promises and even Paul's attitude there that we quoted at the end concerning the nation. Help us, Lord, knowing that they reject our Jesus, but we are going to love them anyway, knowing that one day Israel will be saved in a day when Jesus returns. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.